So hey everyone, I'm Zala and I'm a creative developer at Unseen Studio, as was said. And today I want to talk to you about how we create our projects. But I won't focus on the stages of our process or the specific implementations, but rather I'm here to share the practices that we use behind the scenes that enable us to make the projects that we use, focusing on the ones that we use as developers. But before I start, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So, I mean, you all know, creative developer, already said. Um, I like photography, I also like Mario games, I sometimes go climbing, and I am the only Slovenian that I know of that lives in Bristol, but I'm sure that's not true. Um, so yeah, I work at Unseen Studio, which is a digital design agency that has been in the field for over 12 years now. We specialize in 3D web experiences, although recently we've been doing some AR and VR work too. Now I don't know which water it's is a vibe, It's a vibe, let the door demonstrate light. So I titled my talk Between Chaos and Control because finding the balance between the two is what enables us to make great work. The chaos is where we challenge ourselves to try something new and to experiment, and the control is where we hone in on the details and tie everything together so it actually makes sense. Implementing both of these and going back and forth between the two is essentially what keeps the wheels turning. One of the key concepts in our workflow is experimentation. Now that takes place in different forms, whether it's the art style, or the direction, or the interaction, or simply, can we make this thing? And we don't sometimes know the answer to that question, so there's usually some R&D happening at the beginning of a project. One of the first things that I worked on at Unseen was this shader revealing a building in a high-tech cityscape. This was the initial 3D motion demo that we were trying to replicate in code. And the shader that we used in the end went through several stages of iteration. This was the first one, and it's very simple. It's just a block with a revealing, um, yeah, revealing effect, and we just really wanted to um, test the blockiness of the reveal. And then in the next step, we actually used the geometry that more closely resembled the final model. And you also added some vertex displacement. But we didn't really like how intense it was. It was just way over the top. So then in the next step, we toned it down quite a bit and also added some variation in the um, reveal texture. I don't know if you can see well, but there's a hexagon pattern in there. In the next step, we tied it all together with the camera path so we could see better how it would actually look in the final page. And we also added some bloom and more color variation. And then the next step were the materials. And because we, for ease of use, we wanted it to just be all one mesh, uh, so we could easily just reveal one thing at a time, uh, we went through a little exploration session, thinking about, okay, how can we use different materials and which ones for only specific um, faces on the geometry. And then this was the final product. And you can see the vertex, the vertex displacement is very subtle. Yep. And this next example comes from a website uh, for a game that takes place, uh, sorry, takes inspiration from Norse mythology. The landscape that we presented was quite uh, fantastical, so the art direction was steered towards more graphical styles as opposed to anything too realistic, and we settled on a painterly style. We wanted it to be obvious, but not so that each object would bleed into, into its environment, so instead of a post-processing effect, we decided to displace normals of objects with a stroke texture. Initially, we hand-painted the normals, and that worked quite well when we lit the model with a directional light. Um, but it did limit our freedom to iterate and to scale this thing, because every time we would want to either change the model or add new versions of it, we'd have to do the whole process all over again, and that would just be way too time-consuming. 
So instead, we decided to use a procedural approach, creating tileable texture maps in Substance Designer. And once we combined those, uh, the, the brush texture with object normal, that was, um, yeah, we were satisfied with that. Although, if you looked at the model from the side, you could see some stretching in the Z direction. Um, and to solve this, we opted to use triplanar mapping, which essentially means um, sampling the texture from three different directions and then blending between those to solve that. So both of these examples were um, situations where we had a specific target or goal that we were working towards. And the exploration lied in the how do we get there, essentially. But sometimes that's not the case, and the end result is much more broad and flexible. And sometimes things don't really go according to plan, like in these things where we've got a fish with their eyes going out of their sockets and an exploding building, because it just happens. But regardless, having allocated time for R&D enables us to try things we haven't built before, to notice any obstacles that might prevent us from delivering what we promised, and it also enables us to find uh, alternatives or new approaches. The next principle that we like to stick to is to just constantly keep making things. We find it really important to do smaller encapsulated side projects where we explore a particular technique, style, um, or interaction. And we call them spicy dev projects, hence the title of this section. And the point of these is simply to make a minimum viable product with one focus in mind, so like a demo, not really a final thing. And the emphasis is not on the future applications of um, the demo, although they could be, there could be many, but it is on the process through which we make the thing. And working this way allows rooms for mistakes, trial and error, and enables us to get to the grips of a technique and explore what we can do with it. I mentioned at the beginning that we've been doing some AR and VR work recently. So we explored Athwall, A-Frame, and Spark AR uh, just to see what we could do. And we created a bunch of small projects like these from the levitating rocks, portals, um, and yeah, simple filters. Um, we were working with Blue Marine Foundation at the time, and they are a climate ocean conservation charity, and they want to raise awareness um, about the importance of oceans in terms of climate change. And they asked us to create an Instagram filter. Um, and this was then the final thing, which was basically yeah, a filter that would put you in the middle of the ocean, uh, spawning a bunch of whales that would swim around you, and you could just look at it from yeah, various points. And yeah, that is me promoting the work that I did. <laughs> Following that, they were interested in a bigger, more immersive piece that would leave a bigger impact on the viewer. So we proposed a VR video um, that would play in the headset because that would just be um, yeah, more immersive. But it was the first proper VR thing that we did, so we had to do quite a lot of research and testing because we wanted it to be available on a larger scope of devices, not just one meta quest. The experience was then presented at COP28 in Dubai to policymakers and politicians, and later to school pupils around the UK to educate them about the marine life. And that's not just a guy in a costume, but that was actually his ceremonial clothing. So this was an example where we tried a completely new technology, but there's loads of projects where we just explore a particular WebGL technique. For instance, we had a dev that was interested in flow fields and seeing what she could do with those. So they kind of went from these examples to something like this. Another dev was interested in optimizing particle systems with a lot of detail, so he decided to implement an imposter technique, which actually comes from game, de game development. And this essentially involves faking lighting on a particle using a sprite sheet of normal maps and then changing uh, the, 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 the map 
depending on the angle at which you're viewing the particle. And essentially what that does is gives the illusion of a 3D mesh instead of a flat plane, but with minimum impact on performance. Personally, I was interested in GPGPU or frame or buff frame buffer output particles, sorry, simulations, depending on what you call it, as also Robert uh, spoke about earlier a bit. Um, and these allow for simulating complex behaviors through updating the state of the system based on its previous state. So essentially, each, on each frame, the output is fed into the input to calculate new values and so on. And this is all done yeah, on the GPU through uh, textures. And I've got a little live demo to show. Um, so I started with something really simple. Uh, just, yeah, a mesh um, the particle system that has its positions based on the mesh vertices, and add, I added some mouse interaction to both, based on both on like screen space and through ray casting. Um, but this was still very uh, simple, and it wasn't really utilizing the power of the GPU technique. So then, in the next step, no, not this step, this step, I decided to add some physics, um, which then made it a bit more fluid, and I also added some. Um, motion blur to the particles, which was localized. Uh, so it's like per particle motion blur and also some morphing. And at this point, I felt like I kind of got the hang of it uh, and I could understand the basics of it. And at this step, I believe we released um, a demo on our Unseen Labs page, um, which kind of showcased the learnings of that point. I got different presets of like fire, smoke, and yeah, just a simple thing. But what I really wanted to do actually with this simulation is because it's not useful for just um, you know, particles or forces like that, but I really wanted to try um, doing flow fields. Sorry, not flow fields, uh, fluid sims. Um, so let me just refresh this. And this was like the first example of it. So it was just, yeah, um, simple plane with a fluid sim, but it's on the camera. Um, and then I wanted to combine the particles with the fluid sims to create something like this. And then in the end, decided to add some animations as well. So you've got a cat that's emitting particles, but you can also move, move them around. There we go. Um, so this was a quite a technical project, but sometimes we do things just because they're fun. And I promise I'm not just showing you a million of these without any point, but it will all make sense in the end. But this was just a funny experiment that I did last year. <laughs> Hip hop penguin, because why not? And you can learn about tune shading at the same time. Um, so, carving time out for these smaller projects is beneficial not only from a learning and creative point of view, but it is also motivating and it's fun. Um, yeah. The next thing that I'd like to talk about, moving a bit away from the visuals, but I would like to focus on something that's almost as equally as important as the visuals, and that is the tools. It's important for us uh, at the studio that the communication between the design and the development team runs smoothly. So for that, we've created uh, quite a few setups that work for us, whether that is using existing tools and modifying them so they fit our needs, or just creating our own ones from scratch. An example of the former is our Blender to WebGL exporter, which at this point does quite a lot of things. So it not only exports the models with their positions, um, material properties and textures, but it also exports the camera path and animation, uh, object animations, geometry nodes, environment maps, and a bunch of other things that you can see on the GIF over there. And it also has a live preview function, which with the click of a button essentially loads up a local server so you can live preview the thing that you're developing or creating in Blender. And that's useful both for designers at the beginning uh, of, of a project where they're still blocking out the scene 
and also for us on the dev side, because all the boring stuff like loading the models and positioning them is basically automatic. But it's also useful further down the line when there's a lot of design iteration happening because the designers can just change a texture or move this model a bit to the left and they can all do it themselves without needing the devs to go into code and hard code the values just because um, they decided to change something and that could happen you know, 20 times a day. And usually it works quite fine, although sometimes it still messes stuff up <laughs> pretty brutally. Um, yeah. Recently, we started incorporating theater GS into our setups, and what it allows us to do is to keyframe and animate almost any property in code through the web interface. And we customized it a little bit, so we added some extra camera panels um, so the, the setup mimics a 3D software a bit more because our designers are used to that. And we also added um, a, we also added version control so that we could quickly swap between different, well, yeah, versions um, if we liked a previous animation more because essentially all the values are stored in one file and then we can just quickly load it up and yeah, pick whichever one we want. Um, so this setup also helps this communication between the design and the development team because designers can just tweak any exposed value that they want and save it and you know, it's, it's done. The animation is there. Um, yeah, they basically they see the results in real time. And with this setup, it also allows us to um, have a bit more of an iterative process between the two teams. So it's not like we just have one scene that we then need to replicate, but it, we're kind of designing in dev a little bit, basically having a 3D thing uh, or a concept, doing a bit in dev, going back to design, adding some stuff, and then going back to dev, and it's yeah, this sort of a loop thing. Um, so speaking more on that, uh, this gap between designers and de developers is a space that we aim to make smaller with every project that we do. And it doesn't just mean that the the final result would resemble the concept as much as possible, although that is definitely a part of it. It also means that this exchange of information runs smoothly, for instance, with the help of the tools. But it also means designers pushing what is possible in dev while also knowing the limitations of it. And it is on the dev team to utilize the tech that we have available to us to drive the designs from the beginning. So remember when I made you sit through all of those spicy dev projects for five minutes? Well, they were actually an inspiration and in the end became a fundamental um, part of a client project. But it's not been released yet, so I'm not going to show you it. No, I will. It's just a little sneak peek. And that really is what we strive to do in our work, to make the process from design to dev as simple as possible, and the final product not only to resemble the 3D renders as much as possible, but for the final product to be something that is made better and enhanced by the inherent capabilities of technology. Thank you. And if you've got any questions, you can come up to me later.